Good morning. Welcome to the Filecoin Sanctuary. My name is Britton Heller. I'm from Stanford University and the Atlantic Council. And welcome to our talk today about human rights and Web3. Thank you for having us here today. And special thanks to the Filecoin Foundation and CNBC. With us, we have three speakers who have been working in the realm of human rights as it, as it, as it concerns um, blockchain and decentralized properties. I'm going to let each person introduce themselves with one sentence, and then we're going to go right into questions. <sighs> Bernard, can you please start? Uh, hi, my name is Bernard Kovac. I lead the Global Innovation Accelerator of the UN World Food Program, and we believe that technology and innovation can help us in some of the world's biggest challenges. Hi, I'm Danny O'Brien. I'm with the Falcon Foundation, and I hope run-on sentences are permitted in this particular context, because my background is working in the digital human rights space semicolon. I worked for the Electronic Frontier Foundation for many years on censorship and combating censorship and, uh, uh, censorship and surveillance. And uh, I also worked for the Committee to Protect Journalists for many years where uh, journalists were facing the cutting edge of repression, harassment, and uh, abuse online. Good morning. I'm Jonathan Doten, the founding director of the Starling Lab, which is based at Stanford and USC. We work on Web3 and human rights as it affects historians, lawyers, and journalists. And we've been thrilled to be working with the Falcon Foundation and others for years on this problem and really glad to be here. All right, I think we're going to go in reverse order. So Jonathan, I'll start with you. We are in a, we're living in a digital age where global conflicts and their effects on humans are, are documented and disseminated online and on social media platforms. What challenges can you tell us about from these critical eyewitness accounts? What challenges do they face on the centralized web? And what are you doing about it? So the, the way to think about this type of documentation is they call it open source intelligence. And it means that anyone with a digital device, like a camera, can post things online. And the critical question is, how can we ensure that that type of documentation could be admitted into evidence? And the challenge is, is that in the centralized web of Web2, the large social media platforms, they have all the control about what stays up. And they do something really challenging, which is that they strip out, when you upload a file, all of the critical metadata. And so as a bare file, you have very little context about when the file was created, where it was taken. And so the challenge that we have is that the, the people that are bravely doing this form of documentation are simply unable to rely on the fact that their documentation would remain up, and they have very few tools to provide context around exactly how they took these types of photos and other forms of documentation. How are you ensuring authenticity so that um, metadata is preserved and there is admissibility in court? I'm a former human rights prosecutor, so I'm acutely interested in your answer. So I, I think that the way to uh, where we, we got a lot of traction with the human rights community is we, we started with just some very simple basics, which is that if you can hash and sign a file, what that does is it seals it. And we like to think about taking this type of ephemeral evidence and putting it as something equivalent to like um, an evidence bag. Mm -hmm. And if you have that, you have an ability to seal the information inside of that, like a tweet inside of this bag, and then and, you have met. And, oh, and for the people who are just getting introduced to this technology, a hash is like a digital fingerprint? Exactly. And what that does is it gives you a chance of preserving the information. And this is what's critical. The way that it's stored on something like Web3 is that it's actually chopped up into small pieces and then disseminated into many places. How is that you have these types of technologies that form a network of different activists who are able to keep each of them keep a part of the information. And that means that it's you don't have single points of failure. You're not reliant on one platform, let's say like YouTube, to keep up the information. Instead, you can spread the risk around and ensure that you have a more resilient form of storage. So like a productive redundancy. That's right, yeah. And I can see how that would be really important in the context of preserving evidence in conflict zones or um, trying war crimes, genocide, and crimes against humanity. 
Danny, let's turn to you now. How are you using decentralized data storage to back up other critical records of human history? What type of records and what type of, what type of work are, are you pushing? I think it's so easy to answer that because we say all the things, all right? The things. Like, so, so the, I, I, I've spent a lot of time in the digital space and our understanding about what it means to live in a world that is dominated by its sort of digital twin has, has really changed over time. And one of the things that's changed is I think at the beginning, um, when the web was being built out, we had this idea of not only were we collecting the world's knowledge, but we were preserving it. This very idea of, you know, when Google decided to scan all the books, right? Part of that was because books, we know books are fragile in, so, in some ways, right? We know that, that we've, we've had historically great losses of knowledge because they're in these very temporary physical objects. Um, and then there was sort of this growing realization that actually that's not one of the attributes that, that, that digital uh, data has. It's not permanent. It can evaporate. It can bit rot away. Uh, a huge chunk of uh, those links on the web uh, go to 404 pages, go to uh, dead ends. And when you look at, for instance, court decisions, where many court decisions now have citations to uh, web pages that aren't there anymore. So it's like uh, uh, the knowledge is, is, is more greatly interlinked, but contracted in some ways. So uh, how do you preserve the world's knowledge? Well, it's very similar to what Jonathan was talking about of preserving the world's evidence of what's going on around it. You, what you really want in that kind of uh, resilience is uh, multiple copies. And I think there's a political aspect to this and also sort of something that librarians know very well is you want to keep those copies in multiple places. You want, uh, uh, you want uh, heterogeneous kind of storage of these things, which just means do it in lots of different ways. You don't want a Library of Alexandria kind of scenario. So one of the organizations we work with a great deal is the Internet Archive. And the Internet Archive, as many of you know, uh, runs the Wayback Machine that preserves many of those links. And they're actually in a church as well. They are. They're in a church. Yeah. Near me in San Francisco, it's a beautiful church. It looks exactly like their logo. And you should totally go there on a Friday because they have these beautiful temple to knowledge where you see the servers around you <laughs> blinking in this, uh, this former church. But that church is on the San Andreas fault. And uh, there's one copy of all of that data. And it's the world's backup. So what we're doing with the Internet Archive is trying to decentralize that, store that everywhere. There's a backup copy, incidentally, thanks to the brilliant work of Bruce DeKale, at the original Alexandria, not in, not in uh, DC, but in, uh, in Egypt. And we're trying to spread it around, around uh, the, whole, the whole globe. That is both in both parts practical and poetic. <laughs> Well, I think that's what human rights are, right? Uh, human rights is simultaneously a poetic description of the things we desperately need to run an open society. I, I'm going to turn now to you, Bernard, um, and also point out that you, you missed the memo for uh, snow boots, apparently. It's the first yeah, time I actually changed, you know, uh, just for you. So, like... <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel embarrassed that I didn't now, but... Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bernard... You're taking a, a different tact where I think you're looking more at the application of human rights in more of the physical realm using digital space. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you describe to us how the UN World Food Program is, is experimenting uh -huh. with decentralized technologies, in particular how to use them to solve the world hunger crisis? No, and I, if people don't know what the World Food Problem is, essentially it's where, wherever you hear on the news, the UN is delivering food in Ukraine, in Afghanistan, Gaza, South Sudan, Venezuela, it's the World Food Program. Either physical food could be cash uh, or blockchain enabled cash, uh, but also connecting farmers to markets. So like it's a broad spectrum of emergency response and sustainably ending hunger. And like what we started off uh, actually with, like one of our finance officers came up with the idea for our innovation accelerator is like, why don't we use blockchain technology to make cash transfers more secure, more collaborative, um, and actually also more accountable. And like this is what we started out with and how this system works. It, the, it's actually now in multiple countries active already. Is like, so 
a Syrian refugee can go into a store in Jordan, um, they go shopping, and then they authenticate a transaction with an iris scan that actually, that's the key for the wallet, it's a virtual wallet. Um, and by, we've been using this now for a couple of years. We've transferred $550 million of cash already to people so they can go into stores, purchase food. Um, and coming back to human rights angle, now it's actually better for data privacy because the only thing we're, I mean, so, the only thing we're actually storing is uh, a user hash, like if you want a, a code for the user. We don't even know who the person is because the, essentially we're using a database of the UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, um, to do that. And then just to say, like, why are we doing this? It's like, well, collaboration, but also to make things more effective. So we are, you know, saving actually, like, I don't know, 90, 95% of the banking fees because right now we just, we use a virtual wallet and the last transfer to the retailer is still fiat currency, like cash transfers. Um, but we've also used this now in Ukraine actually to coordinate eight transfers of, right now it's about 30 UN entities and NGOs, not to, for wallets, but for coordinating transfers. And just to, to, to show like what the power of the technology is, but like in 2022, in a three month period, out of $337 million of uh, coordinated aid, we were able to identify $35 million of potentially duplicate transactions that didn't happen and therefore 180,000 people got additional assistance. And this is where I think, just to say, like, why blockchain? Well, it enables uh, collaboration. It enables, like, this exchange of data as you're designing these systems. That, that's incredible. <laughs> that's, that's just incredible. Um, you, you mentioned an iris scan uh -huh. being, being used as an identifier. Um, how, how does using decentralized technologies integrate with digital identities, especially for, for vulnerable populations like refugees? No, I, I think um, uh, data privacy also protection at the core of a lot of the things that would, I mean, as, as I was saying, like we work with refugees also or like in countries that have, you know, ongoing wars and so on. Like, so typically like there's specific, um, you know, data security privacy measures in place for securing the identities of people. Uh, and then we take like, and this is where I'm actually excited about blockchain where you actually have an additional layer for data privacy because you don't need to know the identities of those people. All we know that those people actually exist and they're registered. Right, um, and now we are using multiple things. Like it could be iris scans, it could also be um, you know fingerprints. It could be you know smart contact, uh, smart cards with a, a QR code on it. Once they have been registered, now and this, but this is an interesting angle for us where. Right now, as World Food Program, we are fully voluntarily funded. Right, so the angle of why, why do we use biometrics? It's actually to be more accountable and like efficient. So in terms of like, we make sure that the money or the, if you donate to us, it, the money is actually going to the people that's intended for. Uh, the other thing is also, also for protection angle, like to make sure that, you know, like not people are being misused or like, you know, at registration sites, because like, yes, then we can actually make sure to do that. But as you point out, like it's a, it is a deep issue where we really deeply care about data privacy and security as well. I, we have about five minutes left, so I'm going to give each of you the opportunity to, um, to answer a question that you wish I had asked you. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> and um, if, if that's a little hard on a, on a Thursday morning quite early, um, I, I'd like you to think about what principles of human rights need to be baked into the ne next iteration of the internet. And that can deal with international justice, or um, cognitive liberty, mental privacy, or humanitarian aid. So kind of a, a free, free opportunity to tell people the one thing you think they need to know. I think that we're now heading into a new chapter of the web in which the rise of AI as a part of a ubiquitous part of the web um, is pushing regulators to enter into the space. In many ways, that's welcome because they missed an opportunity to guarantee privacy and to think about um, competition. And, and those types of regulations would have been very helpful in, in the last uh, era of the internet. Um, but here's the problem, is that when you start to think about the work that we do in authenticating imagery or thinking about ways in which um, new technologies can help combat deep fakes, what you don't want is a requirement or an imposition of certain types of laws that require you to authenticate information and essentially start to destroy the ability for you to operate freely and anonymously because privacy is so very important. 
And so the question that um, I, I really believe should be on everyone's mind is, is how can we think about regulation that can actually promote agency of people within this moment as opposed to um, finding new ways to surveil? Because then what will happen as those types of laws emerge, what seemed like a really good idea, a well-meaning thing to say, what's an original photograph and how can we try to make sure that deep fakes are not used in court? What can happen is you can impose laws that require everyone to use this technology and suddenly it's a form of surveillance. So it's, I'm, I'm excited by the possibilities but also deeply committed to um, ensuring that things remain open source and that users have agency in this process. So in essence, we're getting a second bite at the apple. All puns intended. <laughs> so I think I think we 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 play a little fiction in the human rights community because we always uh, talk about human rights as these eternal sort of natural rights. But the truth is, we we construct we construct rights, and we we hopefully as societies progress, uh, we grow the palette of of rights that we uh, we demand. And I think that that progress comes both from new capabilities and uh, new predations. So for instance, the war crimes that, um, that Jonathan uh, is, is working to prevent, we have that concept of a war crime, partly because of the horrors of genocide in World War II, but partly also because we built an international network where we can, we can uh, conceive of the idea that we can prosecute what happens in the otherwise lawless world of, of, of war. Similarly, with, with hunger, you know, one of the reasons why we think of a right to be free from hunger is because we know, as a, as a world now, we have a capability to, to feed each other. And so that becomes something that we want to encode as a possibility. And I think for digital technologies, we have both these vulnerabilities and these new opportunities. And the one that, thank you for mentioning it, Britain. I, I defer, actually, because Britain is, is taking this role as a moderator, but actually does a lot of the, the important thinking in this area of, of cognitive liberty. And I think this is going to be a key part of human rights in the future. Um, I have 30 seconds to tell you what that is, but there, there are magazines and you can read an article that we've written about it. But let me tell you what it is, right? We now, the way we use personal computers, the way people use, use phones now, is really about extending your own consciousness, right? And I don't mean this in an LSD kind of way. What I mean here is that like the people you remember, right? The things that you think, the way that you, you, you uh, uh, recall and, and build your personality, uh, it isn't just like the memories in your mind uh, and that degree of cognition, it's also in your devices. They're extensions of yourself. And so we have to build that shell of privacy and autonomy and protection around our, ourselves and our devices so we can extend it. But there's also a risk of contracting it in XR, uh, virtual reality as Britain works in, and also the things that you see with Neuralink um, and uh, mind uh, computer connections, there's a very real possibility that the area of our freedom, our cognitive freedom, is going to contract as suddenly people are able to predict and maybe even influence the thoughts that we have in ourselves. So I want, that would be the thing that I'm thinking the most about. Like, how do we create a border around our individual individualities and have that have the same protections in our society as the other new and old human rights. Well, th thank you for, um, for the shout out. Uh, my work has been focusing on re-examining existing law for new constellations of technology. And that includes blockchain web three, it includes XR extended reality, and it includes forms of artificial intelligence. Because if you focus on one part in isolation of the others, you're missing the big picture. Mm. And so looking at fundamental human rights like privacy and seeing how concepts perhaps premised on um, personal identifying information may be missing the boat on behavioral and inferential data that we can now get from new forms of physical digital hybridized space. So that, that's, that's a little what I work on. But let's conclude with... Well, maybe let me build on what uh, Danny was mentioning on like new capabilities. And like uh, as some context, so, like before starting our accelerator, I co-found an app called Share the Meal, which is 
was app of the year by Apple and Google in year 2020. Uh, it's essentially micro donation app, 70, uh, so 80 cents can feed a child for a day on one tap on your smartphone. That's the basic premise. Um, now, new capabilities, and this is where decentralized web or web three can really be an interesting game changer for us is like, so what we started with the GBBC, uh, Global Blockchain Business Council, and also actually now in discussion with Filecoin Foundation on this, is like, how can we take this to the next level, right? Like, so if you wanna donate and you wanna provide food assistance or cash to somebody, you wanna have choice, you wanna have transparency, you wanna have accountability, like what's happening with the money. And this is really what we're working on right now. We call this Food for Crisis Web3 initiative, really from end-to-end -end transparency on like, you know, donations that you have. And, you know, I and we believe that we can actually like, and I don't know, maybe even in the audience or people listening to this were like, is this something that excites you? Is this something where you say, well, I have more transparency, I have more accountability. That's why I would actually now trust that the money is reaching the people that's intended for, and therefore I want to share, you know, some money to help people lift them out of hunger. Um, that's what we're working on. I mean, with a vision goal of one billion dollars, you know, like you, this is um, not sure if we reach this this year. Maybe with some support of the people here in the room. Uh, but I, 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 without joking, I think this is starting with humanitarian response, but then also going into like funding startups, funding sustainable ending hunger and I believe this is where the you know technology can be an enabler of like providing the trust providing these capabilities that people then all of a sudden say hey that's really exciting mm -hmm. I really can see what's happening with you know I can have an impact I can make a difference and I think that's an uh, for me like if we're able to pull this off I think that will be really exciting well thank you Jonathan Danny and Bernard for being here I I'm pretty excited about the potential of blockchain and decentralized properties to augment human potential, whether or not that's in data authenticity, new precepts of human rights, or the ability to make an individual difference in the lives of others. Thank you all for being here with us today, and have a great day.